Does he need headphones? Um, if you yeah. want them. Yeah, go on. Thank you, Mark. Who's that? I don't want to see my Hello, my name is Steve Jones. And there are only two times when I am truly happy. One is when I'm at home in bed watching the History Channel. And two, when I'm here at Indy 1031 doing my radio show with my friend, Mr. Shovel. Hey, Steve! Weekdays, noon to two. Again at six, and again at six. Jonesy's jukebox. Monday through Friday, 12 to 2. The only place you can hear ELO, the Brady kids, and the Sex Pistols all in one day. Jesus, now I've heard everything. You're listening to Jonesy's Jukebox on Indy 1031 on this miserable, overcast Wednesday. What's happened, Mr. Shovel? I thought it was summer. And supposedly it's going to rain tomorrow and Friday. It's all a matter of how you look at things, Steve. What's going on here? Bleeding cheek. Bleeding weather. California. And we've got a guest here today, Mr. Tony Wilson. Hello, Tony. Where I come from, it's like this all the time, so how you dare complain, I don't know. Have you uh, ever thought about moving away from... Uh, where do you live? I, I live in Manchester, remember, up in the north of England, and um, I often think about moving to Los Angeles. It's a wonderful place, and I can quite see why you... Can I say the word stuck? Yeah. You've been here, what, 20, 24 years? 24 years, 25 years, something like that. So, but there is a bit of a cheek there where you, compl you, you get very little bad weather, so mm -hmm. then you, you do complain, though, don't you, when you... But this is weird for this time of the year. It's normally, uh... Is it, isn't it sunny by now? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> we get the occasional Life cloud. Life isn't like that, is it? Oh, the shovel, the meteorologist. So, I mean, the, I was over... Two, four weeks ago, five weeks ago, which is when I first encountered um, my heroic guitarist dominating the airwaves, and um, it was raining then as well. So I'm getting used to it raining in LA. Yeah, yeah. We, we had a we had a bad. Uh, it was like the heaviest rain we've had in I don't know, hundred years or something. That's right. Well, we went home to England. We told everybody it was fantastic because. Um, Michael Jackson trial was item two on the news. Something else like Iraq war was item three. But item one was, it's been raining, and that was very impressive. Well, it's very in in, in LA. That's very newsworthy because houses fall down hills and stuff like that. People lose their record collections in mudslides. Yeah, I love it. So this is I'm being very unfair because I'm actually here to interview you. Yes. On your interview show. Yes. And. Um, uh, the reason that we have a connection is that uh, I still dine out today in 2000, and is it five or something? Yeah. Is it? On the fact that I put you on television for the first time. It's one of my proudest achievements to have actually affected British culture in that way, to put this rapscallion band on television back in the summer of 1976. 76. <laughs> so It Goes was the show, right? So It Goes was the show, and you performed Anarchy in the UK, and um, I had the celebrated job of having to... Um, in the mid-afternoon, my producer called me in and said, you do realize, Tony, this is a Jewish television company, because Granada was the great Bernstein's company. Um, you do realize that girl is wearing a swastika armband, and I was the one that had to go and get Jordan, your roadie. Well, I tried to get her to take off the swastika armband, but in the end, a gaffer tape, which is the great miracle of the 20th century, gaffer tape was used to cover up the swastika I armband. I didn't even notice that. Yeah. Now I'm going to have to look at that again. Now. Look at it again. You'll see the swastika armband, and she and Niels, your yeah. road manager, kicked Roddy. the set apart, yes. <laughs> Those are my moments. But I'm here to, to, because every every day you sit here, you play wonderful music, I've listened to the show, but no one in England, except the ones who've been over here, know about this, so it's to actually interview you and take this, this tape back to Britain and show it in the autumn. Mm. So can I ask you, and I, I suppose for all your fans out there, uh, non-musical fans, but fans of the show, it's probably time to refresh them as to where this comes from. So to explain, whose idea was Jones's jukebox? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I guess it was a... Uh, well, it started... I got a phone call a year and four months ago. Well, it started... I listened to the show. The, the station started. My mate said, hey, have you heard this new station? I'm like, no. And I turned it on. There was no commercials, and all they played was... Old stuff, Joy Division, Pistols, Clash. You know, I've never heard anything like it. You know what I mean? I'm like, wow, what is this? 
and it was exciting. So two weeks later, I get a phone call from this bloke who said, um, my boss can't believe that I know you, and would you be interested in talking to him about this new station? I said, yeah, I love this station. What is it? So anyway, he calls me up, and out of nowhere, I said, I, I want to be a DJ. <laughs> Just out of the blue, it was like, you know, someone else was making me say it, like a god or whatever you want to call it. Anyway, and I said, um, he said, uh, all right, and uh, well, I'll come over your house. And he came over my house with Mr. Shovel, and... Um, this was a guy, because I've read a bit of background here, I do my work, Steve, very hard. Mm -hmm. It was a guy from Maverick, wasn't it? Maverick Records formerly, who'd known you. Yeah, Terry Anzaldo was the bloke who made, who, who made, made, the, made the connection with me and Michael Steele. The bloke, the, what, what, what's his position? Michael Steele's position? Program director. Program director. The station had been going about three weeks at this point. And, um, and uh, I, had a, I was so miserable. I've never had a job, for one thing. But I, was, I, I, I had a bad back, and I'd been in back pain for about a year, and I was just lying in bed, and I was so bored with being in bed, in bed and doing nothing. And that's why I think, I said, I, I, yeah, and I, I, give me a job, you know, I'll be a DJ. And then they come over, because I couldn't go and visit them, because I had my legs up in the air, in my bed. In his boxers. And uh, we started talking about it, and I said, I would love to do it. Two conditions, though. You let me play what I want and say what I want. And they said, yeah, fair enough. And that's what it's been ever since. He's never said a word uh, to, you know, like, say, oh, I don't think you should say that or you should play that. They've just let me get on with it. And when did you become aware? Because you are, <coughs> can we say, you're a, you're a major cult in this city, which is one of the great cities of the world. It's 103.1 has, has an amazing reputation, and so do you. When, when were you aware that it worked, that you as a DJ? Uh, I still have... <laughs> problems accepting that it's doing as well as it is to be honest with you truthfully you know I mean I, I, I hear it all the time from the weirdest straightest dudes that that's all they listen to is Jonesy's jukebox but it's still hard to accept you know the musical taste which you display is excitingly different let's let's put it that way I mean uh, doing some of my research here I didn't realize and I'm quite upset, really, that you're a Boston fan. Yeah, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I loved them back in the pistol days. I just couldn't tell anybody. You couldn't. I mean, one of the most depressing moments of my life was after you changed my life, and then in early 78, going down a street near Granada, I saw a strummer walking along, and Strummer had a big ghetto blaster on his shoulder. Mm. And I stopped the car and went, hello, Joe, I said, hello, Toe. I said, what are you listening to, man? He went, the new Rolling Stones album, man. Still, and I'm... And that was one of the most terrible moments of my life. Mm. I thought we were meant to get rid of all that shit, but you lot were secretly inside nurturing some love for it. I know. <laughs> what do you listen to? Me? Well, I, uh, then all I listened to was, was you lot changed my life, because the early 70s, for me, because I'm a generation before you, aren't I? Yeah. Fact, some people think that punk was the revenge of the hippies. You know, we'd gone through all that wonderful 60s stuff, and then the early 70s, to me, was utter, utter shite. Yeah. And it needed something, which was you. But you lot, yeah, you were very quiet about that. Although the very first time I saw you, ca can you remember what you were wearing when you played the Lesser Free Trade Hall in Manchester? Um, the first time. Is that the, the first very one? very first time. Is that the one? If let, let, Let's fill people in who yes. you are. There's a lot of people who are listening. No, they probably exactly. have no idea who you they are. Haven't at all. I'm a local TV presenter in Manchester, or I was until I used the same two words that you used in 76. Uh, about a year ago and got fired as well. Um, I'm a local TV presenter who happened to put a lot of bands, including the Pistols, on television for the first time. It's my privilege. And I run a record company called Factory Records for several years and had bands like Joy Division and the Happy Mondays. And I now have a band called Raw Tea. And there was a movie about you? There was a movie about me. 24-hour party, party people. people. Yes. You, you hate that, don't you? You hate it as much as I hate Sid and Nancy. I can tell. No, I actually loved the movie. Actually, very strange. I expected to hate it. I absolutely loved it. I loved the fact that it was a collection of complete lies, that I never got gobbled in the back of a van by those two prostitutes. All those things were all made up, but the movie somehow... Because film people, like Sid and Nancy, film people, when they touch music, they usually screw up, don't they? Mm -hmm. Film people don't understand the music right. industry. So for once, they got it right. 
some strange way by being completely ignoring documentary. And it worked. I, mean, I, I was very proud of 24 Hour. And I'm very proud of the impact it's had in America. People have, it wasn't a big hit in the, in the cinemas, but the DVD sold very, very well. So You've got to be flattered that you would, was acknowledged like that. I'm extremely, extremely flattered. Mm. I'm very pleased that, it, that the second scene is the, the, the central moment to me in the whole thing is when you lot, the four of you, jump on that stage in Manchester and there's 35 people and in that small audience that first day, which was June the 4th, 1976, June the, July the 20th when you came back there was about 2,000 people, but that first day I think two of the members of Joy Division, I think Barney and Hookie were in the audience, I was in the audience, Gretton was in the audience, Morrissey was in the audience, um, a little red-headed our called Huckner was in the audience, and uh, Mark Sm Marky Smith was in the audience. Everybody who went on to make Manchester music and, and take it forward was it was there that day, just being utterly stunned by you. And one of the the, the true thing I had a row with them when they, when, I, when I saw the first first cut, they have us pogoing at that uh, at that gig, mm -hmm. and of course at that gig, the pogo hadn't been invented. Right. And I always say what we did was we all sat in our chairs. It was in chairs with our mouths open in complete shock. We hadn't seen anything like this in our lives. We were utterly amazed. And I had no idea what you were doing until the seventh number you did Stepping Stone by the Monkeys. And you remembered that song? Well, I knew the song. And yeah. to, hear, to hear the Sex Pistols do this, do, do that was just, it explained everything. And I'm a Boston fan. And you're a Boston fan. And, so, and also that day, the point of this is, I always tell people, listen, I saw the Pistols so early. Jones was still wearing a jumpsuit and doing Pete Townsend impersonations. Remember that you were swirling, you were, twir you were twirling your arm, pure Pete Town. Yeah, well, they, they were, <laughs> he was a big, a big fan of the Who. Exactly, and... exactly. But one month later, you were telling the world hippies must die, yeah. kill all hippies. It's all too confusing. <laughs> it's, to me, it's very specific. Early June, you were still wearing a jumpsuit and doing Townsend. Late July, kill the hippies. You know, we're the revolution. Yeah, don't never trust a hippie. <laughs> never trust a hippie. <laughs> but but you know, it, we, it, we, all these quotes that people claim that we are like oh punks don't take drugs we just we are we were a rock and roll band the number one well, you know what i mean and we get up to rock and roll things well that's what I, wa I wanted to ask you one of the main things to ask you about if we go back to the pistols supposed to let's let's let's, let's have some do music. some breaks because uh, yes. people are going like what's, what's yeah, the music too old fast bastards, talking yeah. let's play um um let's fenty this, this, you might like this bizarre love triangle. Take oh, it away. This Mr. is an Australian bunch. It's a bird singing on the light it's acoustic. Fa it's fantastic. Yeah, take it away, shovel. Every time I think of you, I get a shot right through it. Good stuff. Can't say shit. Okay, okay, baby. I, I, I hit the dump button, but okay, good. Okay. He's an amateur. I know. <laughs> They're really uptight. No, I recently got fired because it was exactly the same. He used the word fucking twice, which yeah. was on the trouble. Yeah. Although everyone thinks it was jobless, well, it wasn't. No. But I was, I'm the true punk. I was reading the news mid afternoon in the middle of the children's programming about a year and a half ago. And if we come on air, and there's two cameras in front of me, and neither one has a red light on, so I don't know which one I'm on. So my eyes are going. In the end, we get through it. And then we come back to me. It's a short one. I go, in, I go into this item. The item comes up. And I go, camera one, where's your fucking red light? Turn your fucking red light on. And only was camera one that needed it. The sound man had been off for three months and hadn't been told his mute button didn't work. So went out over children's IT. Five. Wow. You're listening to Jonesy's Jukebox on Indie 1031 with my guest Tony Wilson. That was uh, Jonathan King, the Kung Fu Anthem. And then before that, we had uh, Sugar Candy Kisses by Mac and Katie Kassoon. And then we started out with Fenty. Friend, Frente. Friend, Frente. Frente. What does that mean then? Frente. I don't know. They were, they were an Australian folk group, and I first came across that in a... Banana Republic in Seattle, and I thought, oh my God, that's a song I recognize. And I've always thought Bizarre Love Triangle was, of all the New Order songs, the most musical, non-songy. And yet it works as a beautiful folk song. When done, and that went to, went to quite high in the charts, probably higher than New Order went in the charts here. Yeah. Was, um, was that on your label, that song? Yes, but yes Bizarre Love Triangle. Yeah. In fact, Robert Longo, the great Los Angeles artist, made a fantastic video for it, I seem to recall. Yeah, very good. 
Do you know they played over the weekend, right? They played at Coachella, saw that. It was quite good, although Barney had a bad foot. And that's the reason, the way people are beginning to learn about Jones's jukebox in England is that our boys come back. I mean, Ian Brown came back, was raving about appearing on this show. Right. And now I've heard that Barney and Hooky were in the other day and they loved it as well. So the word's coming back that, you know, Jones has got a bloody job. Um, do, you think, do you think we can get it syndicated in England? I don't think you need to in the sense that digital... Digital radio is almost here, and I'm, sh I'm sure this goes out digitally, does it, somewhere? It's a stream. It, it gets streamed, and the great moment when the world changes is when the first Ford Focus arrives automatically with, with DAB, mm. and that's about six months away. But that don't help me. I've got to get paid. Well, they, they won't pay you here, will they? No, it'll just be sort of seen as sort of some sideline. Yeah, well, talk to Shovel about that. He's obviously in charge of all that stuff. I've got to get paid. You want to hear well, Jonesy's jukebox in England? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Digital is, it's piracy. But it is, I mean... The I'll stop. I'll stop doing it. <laughs> Do you have an agent? Yes. A good agent? Yeah. Okay, fine. Double agent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me, ask you what, let me ask you more about 103.1, because as you say, when you were asked about this, you said, oh my God, I've been listening to this, it's fantastic. Yeah. And it is fantastic. What is so special about 103.1? It's called indie. Right. Which is kind of a rather old-fashioned word, isn't it? I have no idea what that means, indie. I really don't know what it means. Independent? Someone told me that it had found that K-Rock, the great alternative station, mm -hmm. had become an alternative rock station and wasn't playing the music for a ho There's a whole bunch of people who were being disenfranchised or not serviced, and suddenly 103.1 found right. that. Is that how you see it? Um, in a nutshell, yeah. The, yeah. I mean, K-Rock kind of caters to young kids, I think. You know, it's all uh, Lincoln Park and all that fodder. And I think you know, young kids are not... They'll, 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 they'll take whatever K-Rock gives them, basically. But you, you've also... 103 has changed a little bit in recent months in that it now also plays the very new young breed of bands. Yeah, that we started playing first, yeah. Yes. I mean that. I mean, again, they were playing Coachella this weekend, like Kasabian and the rest of it. You've been playing that that kind of area, so that's kind of. Well, we started playing the Killers, Franz Ferdinand, way before anyone else did. I know I was, wasn't I, Mr. Shovel? Yeah, you're always ahead of the curve. But we were always playing new stuff right from the beginning, as well as old stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think it's. I mean, in this very saturated, massive market, to have hit home so well. And that's why we're here talking about this. I suppose. The other thing to say is what's very odd for us, and I'm going to not be rude here because I might get to, might take me off the air or whatever else. What people don't know is that, that part of the guiding force, this is an Hispanic station, isn't it? Or yes. Was? Company. No, no, it com is. Hispanic company. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, I can tell that Steve doesn't talk Spanish. But... C. <laughs> isn't, isn't the programming of this, wasn't the, didn't the idea come out of Clear Channel? Shovel, come on. Or you can should... You should talk to Michael Steele about I that. Thought, I, thought, I should talk to director. Michael Steele. I'm sorry, but but it's just the fact that this is such um, a radical station, and yet, and I know there's a clear channel involvement, and in Britain, there no longer is. There no longer is. No. No. Fine. So can I? I'm not being rude, but in Britain, we perceive clear channel as the great monolithic sort of the devil, the devil, the devil. That's your mobile. The devil's concubine. The devil's concubine. But in fact, so how something as radical as could have come out of. I mean, because of the Dixie Chicks and the rest of it, we presume that the, the Clear Channel monolith is something kind of dangerous or whatever, and yet th there's something ver so fresh about this. It doesn't make sense. Well, as soon as, the, as soon as the heads in Texas found out about it, they said, get rid of it. <laughs> we didn't know that was going on. Get rid of it. But Clear Channel's no longer involved with us. Okay. Which leaves us even more free. Even more Even free. more indie. <laughs> even more indie. <laughs> Listen, I'm, an indie. I'm, I'm the indie person. As well. Whatever that means. It's... It used to mean people like my band Joy Division in long raincoats. Really, that's what it used to mean. Playing guitars. Indy, that's, Indy. that's what indie used to mean. After, after you left, <coughs> left England. When did you leave England? Twenty-four years. That's nineteen eighty-one. Man, it was. It was actually. The, it was on the road with the professionals, and the bodyguard we had in the professionals wanting to beat me up. He says, "If you get on that plane back to London, I'm going to smash your face in." So I stayed <laughs> in New York for twelve. For I didn't go back to England for twelve years. I stayed in New York for a year. And I drifted out here. It was a godsend, really, in, in saying that. And it's, um, it's a godsend, except you've lived a str 
a really bizarre until this wonderful thing has happened and and um you become central to LA life every lunchtime there was a to me is a conf confusion which is the two sides that we hear about before this came along are your back problems and playing football mm -hmm. having a back problem and playing football do not go together steve right how did you play football with a back problem well i weren't playing football when my back was when i was in a real mess so I'd, 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 I'd mess my back up don't laugh at this no. by spinning you know what spinning is is that that kind of sort of new age exercise you're on a stationary bike yeah with about 30 other people yeah. and you follow this woman who's in are playing music and you have to stay in time to it and I was an expert at it it's a real ginger concept you know spinning but I did I, got, I did it so much I obsessed like I do everything else I have a s obsessive personality that my back went out and I had a slip disc from it so for like a year and a half I was taking the believe it or not I was taking Vioxx for almost three years they're the pills that they took off the market that were people were dropping dead those are the uh, sort of painkiller, addictive painkillers? No, not no? painkillers. I, I didn't take any painkillers. I'm proud of that. I wanted to sometimes, but these are anti-inflammatory pills. They're like for arthritis. That's what they were made for, but they're good for anti-inflammatory. They just take them off the market. I don't know if it was in England, but it was a big deal where look, 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 they're dodgy, you know what I mean? And, and they're being sued left, right and centre. A big multi-million dollar company. So, so, you, you so I survived on them, and I could play football on them. Even, even though you've done your back through spinning? Yeah, I had, I had epidurals, I had about eight epidurals. Is that what women have when they're giving birth? Yeah, but it's just the procedure. It's just, oh. it's what they put in the injection is different. Okay, but that's straight into your spine? Yeah. And how's your back now? It's all right. I had an operation. I had this weird operation. It was like a microscopic operation where they go in with a little thing and they cut off a bit of the disc. Because it was bulging, it was pressing on the nerve, and that, and that was the grief I was getting. And they cut that out, and, I, and the, the recovery, they said, oh, yeah, two weeks, you'll be up running around. Like, and that's when I was in bed for, like, you know. And that, what's bizarre, though, as soon as I got this job, the back pain went away. Isn't that weird? I think that's very weird. Because in my head, my head space changed. You know. Anyway, we've got to visit the Duke right now. We're with Tony Wilson, and we'll be right back. Thanks for listening. You're listening to Jones's Jukebox on Indie 1031 with my guest Tony Wilson, star of 24-hour party people, or, or no, not a star. What do you call it? Um, subject. The subject. And I do recommend the sequel. There's a sequel which is called Cock and Bull Story, or The Life and Times of Tristram Shandy, which was the first novel ever written in the English language back in 1730, which is more weird than P Monty Python. And that's the new film starring Steve Coogan, where he does, he basically plays the same role again. Yeah. But that's going to be out this autumn. I do recommend that. Very funny. Excellent. Did, did, that, did that to pay you to use your likeness? Uh, no, they paid me £10,000 about six years ago to work on the film. And about three years later, having worked every other day for three and a half years, uh, walking around Manchester with a mobile phone to my ear, arguing actually arguing with Anita, your manager, in L.A., about the rights to <laughs> Anarchy in the U.K. for the soundtrack, I actually was thinking, while talking to Anita, not Ryan, because she's a lovely lady, but thinking, the £10,000 ran out a long, long, yeah. long time ago. That's how life works, anyway. Yeah. It, was, it was flattering, it was flattering. Yeah. I, I heard you had an idea of making a canal go through the middle of uh, England to, to get a uh, ship in. Is that true? That was Manchester. Manchester. Manchester had that idea back in the... Wasn't that your idea? No, it wasn't my idea. No, I think it was oh. the 1890s. I wasn't alive then. Um, it was... It why, was is your, why are you involved? Why, why is your name taken to that? I'm just misinformed. No, I'm just... I suppose I give... Well, for example, there was a man called the Duke of Bridgewater who... Uh, what a name. Had a, a Francis Edgerton who had a, had a coal mine in Worsley outside Manchester, eight miles outside Manchester, and in about 1750, he got um, done over by a woman, got depressed, went on a tour of Europe and saw the Canal de Midi. Saw this canal and thought, oh my heavens, a canal. This could be really clever. And he built a canal from Worsley into Manchester and that halved the cost of his coal. And it began the Industrial Revolution. Right. And I give this speech a lot because when the internet came along and the possibility for transmitting music by internet, 
it was exactly the same as the canals kicking off the Industrial Revolution. Mm. The internet was the best thing that could have happened to music, disintermediation, whatever you call it, and our industry. Have you noticed that the bosses of record companies are not very clever sometimes? I have noticed that, yeah, yes. Yeah, it, it's, it's weird, isn't it? You'd think they'd be quite bright, wouldn't mm. you? But no. There's a couple of them that have got their head screws on, but the majority don't seem like they don't, no, it's not it's not about music that's for sure well, it's not, but also the fact that they didn't recognize the the fact that they spent 10 years trying to stop the internet yeah. and you know that back in the 30s we tried to stop this radio we thought radio would be a really disastrous thing for us so the music industry tried to stop radio it was like the uh, the, the building of uh, what's that big metal building in paris the big gaff in paris the f famous eiffel the, tower the eiffel tower the, the frogs didn't want that when it was built. <laughs> they hated that until everyone liked it. Yeah, and then people come around to it. Well, suddenly the music, the music industry now, as we know, has accepted the internet. It's taken so long, and it's just such a wonderful thing. I mean, I think you're going to play some Freddie and the Dreamers tracks later, and I just, I would never in a million light years go out and think, I need to buy a Freddie and the Dreamers album, even if there was one in the local HMV. But thanks to the internet, just go on, click in Freddie and the, and Freddie and the Dreamers, by the way, for those Los Angeles who don't know, was Manchester's answer to Mersey Beat. Was it? Yeah, uh, it was. It, and Jerry and the Pacemakers. Liverpool had the Beatles, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Billy Joe Kramer and the Dakotas, and um, Brian Poole and the Tremolos, and we had Freddie and the Dreamers, which I always think is a postmodern joke. Freddie, by the way, if you do Google him and go and have a look at a picture, he got those glasses... Your mobile, Steve. He got those glasses from Stratford's Woolworth. Woolworth's in Stratford. There we go. Freddie and the Dreamers. Oh, I've got a text for you. <laughs> Say hi to Tony and tell him that Seymour Stein will be in L.A. tomorrow. Oh, my God. Uh, uh, for those who don't know, this, uh, this is the most intelligent member of the music profession ever. The man who signed Madonna, the Ramones, one of your favourites. So he's a top guy. He's, 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 Seymour he's, he's is the ultimate. He's the ultimate. The so ultimate. there's one bloke. There's, there are some good... There's me. I'm in the right, music industry. Right. I'm quite bright. There's a few of them. There's a few of us. But Seymour, Seymour is the man, and if Seymour's in town tomorrow, that's fantastic news. Where do you think it's going in the music industry? Where do you think it's going? I just think it remains great. I mean, at the moment in England... Grey? Great. 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 It remains great. Do you, do, you, do you have kids? No. You don't? Waste of time. Waste of time. Well, I have two children, and everyone I know in the industry in Britain, they moan about the industry, but then they admit that their children are even more obsessed with music than they ever were. And that's why it's such a great future. Mm. The kids love it, and I don't know, at the moment I'm involved with a hip-hop band in England who I love, some young 17-year-old boys, uh, rappers from Moss Side in Manchester, and in that particular area of British music, British black youth have found their own voice. For the first time, I mean, it really begins with Dizzy Rascal and Mike Skinner and the rest of it, but they sound like themselves, not like copies of America. And yeah. that's really exciting. Right, right. You've got this new wave of bands now, which, which, which you here on this show are sort of proselytizing for, if I can use a complicated long word. So, um, it um, sounds good, whatever that word it was. Means, it means you're, you're promoting them. Right, which, okay. And uh, I think it's, it's just healthy. I mean, I had hoped that American New Metal, which was fantastic in the late 90s, would actually happen in Britain, or rather, would, would infuse British bands who would then churn it out with English irony and it would be good. And in fact, it did happen, but only in terms of the Rhondda Valley. Because the Lost Prophets and Funeral for a Friend were the, were the two sort of British bands that did something. But then it goes quiet again, but now you've got all these bands, you've got loads of them, it's fantastic. Mm. And in fact, at some point, we shouldn't do this now, but we want to talk about bringing some British unsigned bands to America in the autumn. But that's with 103's assistance, but that... We can talk about that later. That's just that's just business. My partner wants to know, what did you do in New York that first year in New York away from England? I lived with a prostitute and shot heroin. Sounds like Eric Cantona. Um, I don't, I don't know how to go on with that question, actually. More, de more details? Um, I don't think I do want more details. Yeah, which, how, did, how did you... Um, I don't know. Well, she, well, she, could, went, could, she went out and worked, and I stayed at home and shot the dope. So, having seen what happened to your bass player, your second bass player, Sid, yes. didn't that warn you? No, that don't, that don't do nothing, does it? What goes on outside okay. does nothing. So you did a year. Whereabouts in Manhattan was that? All over the place. Chelsea Hotel. We were just going from hotel to hotel. I didn't know what I was doing. I, I was so lost. It was clueless. 
Was that that was after Brazil? Um, well, after Brazil, yeah, yeah, yes. Brazil was Malcolm's post John effort too. Yeah, Brazil was at the end of the pistols. Like yes, just like we did San Francisco, and then the yeah. a couple of days later we went to Brazil. So that was a, a little. That was that was when I, I oh yeah the, after the professionals and I stayed there, met the hooker. She was a nice girl though. I'm not putting hookers down. She was a sweetheart, and then and I met another bird, who later went on to be my girlfriend, and we had that whole thing with dope and. And then I kind of drifted out here in another band called Checkered Past. And then, you know, I did that for a couple more years and then I got sober. I was like, lucky enough to get sober. You were. I mean, that's the funny thing. People don't say that about, about heroin, that 10% of people on heroin die. 10% remain, he remain junkies go back on it, yeah. all their lives and survive till they're 70 like the British romantic poets. And a lot of people, 60 or 70%, their lifestyle changes in some way, and it stops. Mm. And was it the move to LA that, that sorted you out? I think that was the big shift, what helped me, uh, you know, a big shift in my head. I definitely think that had a, a lot to do with it. And I got to put it down, I'm not, a sp I'm not a religious person, but I got to put it down to I was being steered, you know, out here for whatever reasons, you know. No, let's have no religion. No, no, it's not religious, but I do believe that there's a reason I get you get kind of pushed around in uh, areas by whatever reasons happened, and I think I believe and I got a, I didn't I don't know why I, I moved that I didn't know what I was doing. Destiny. Yeah. Destiny, and you're you were destined to be sitting on that chair, hosting the most the coolest radio show in Los Angeles. I love it that you think that. No, I'm, well, every, everybody thinks it, I and mean, anyone who hears it is so refreshing. It's yeah. just refreshing the way you do it, the honesty, and the fact that, although I'm still coming to terms with the fact that you're a Boston fan and the fact that you've destroyed all my childhood I don't dreams. listen to them every day. Uh, no. I'm <laughs> just, how's that, sir? The fact that you even never listen to them at all is... is, is, is but also... What, uh, don't, what don't you like about Boston? No, it's just the whole idea of the early 70s and the way music went, and your reputation as the enema I think on some TV show in Britain, I described you as this great enema that was required by rock and roll. Yeah. And to go back to that period... But that's one thing. Listen yes. to Boston. Boston is my personal life. Okay. okay. That's got nothing to do with the pistols and what we did. I'm talking about art now. The fact is, let's go back to one other thing. There is we this... Should, we, should, we should play a song. Oh, please play a song. We sorry, should play a song. Sorry, We're going to lose listeners. Yes, I'm sure are. it's very exciting, this talking, isn't it? <laughs> but we've got to play a song every now and again. Yeah. The, uh, well, listen, trust me, after I play this song, they're going to wish we were talking again. Go on. This is Bernard <laughs> Cribbins. Right said Fred. <laughs> Take it away, it. Mr. Shovel. <laughs> You're listening to Jones's Jukebox on Indie 1031. That was Benny Hill from the ultimate collection and that song was Lonely Boy and then we had Bernard Cribbins doing Right Said Fred that was it wasn't it just the two songs that was just the two songs I think yes and now we are going to give away two pairs of tickets to Loretta, Loretta Lynn May 7th at the Galaxy Theatre Saturday May 7th and, and for your, your public in Britain, who are going to be watching this as a podcast, by the way, later mm -hmm. in the year, this is a special section of your show, is it? The whistling. What, what's it called? Where you whistle? Whistle for winners. Whistle for winners. Yes. Who came up with that stunning title? Me. <laughs> well, it's all my creation. Fine. And you've got a guitar in your hand, and I have to say, you've been rehearsing this while the song was on, and this is perhaps one of the most depressing moments of my life. Okay, great. The fact that you are a very good guitarist is truly depressing for someone like me who... I'm not here. My name is Chris Spedding, really. Okay, fine. Good God. Um, oh. So here we go. Yeah, 877-900-1031. You all you've got to do is tell me what I'm playing on my axe, man. Um... <whistles> So good.
can't, I can't whistle and laugh at the same time. <laughs> Sorry. Eight seven seven nine hundred one zero three one, and thanks for listening. Isn't it hilarious that you can get on the radio and do shit I like this? I, I, it's I, the best. You're listening to Jonesy's jukebox on Indy one zero three one with my guest Tony Wilson. Good afternoon. Sir. That was Johnny Nash, the reggae collection, a best of. Doesn't that make you smile? Just Listen to that. Oh, I love it. Just, it's gorgeous. I mean, there's times when I just want to play music. I don't want to talk at all. I just want to play music and listen. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's that's uh, that's one of them songs. Makes you feel all warm and cuddly. You know what I mean? Like everything's going to be all right. <laughs> I'm listening to Johnny Nash and Cliff Richards. We're all going to be all right. Yes. The we're, not gonna, we're not going to get nuked. No. No. Um, before that was the dis dissociates. Am I saying that right? The dissociates, I, I go for that. Dissociates. Are they dissociatives? I'm not sure, I can't read. What's it say? It's the dissociatives. The dissociatives. <laughs> and that was track four, lifting the veil from the bra bra braille. Talking about a blind bloke. Shovel, that? I think you're going to have to write down these things more carefully. It's, yeah, it's, but then, it's, then it's, I still it, read it and it's the same writing. It's bad typography. No, it's, it's bad typo. It's not your fault. It's the designer. Whoever designed that sleeve wants shooting. I know, but that, a, lot, a lot of new bands do that. Yeah. Some, you can't even read at all. It's like, it's like, you know, the enigma <laughs> to figure it out. The code thing, the German U-boat thing. And then we started out with the whistle, and that was Cliff Richard doing uh, the young ones. And um, what did I want to ask you? I don't, I don't what do you think is going to happen to radio, in your mind? To radio, I'm just, I've, I, I went to do some DJing. I'm not as good as you, Steve, but I did some work for um, Radio 6, which is BBC. And I turned up thinking, you know, I insisted they pay me 300 quid a day. You know, I'm such a hard-ass negotiator. And um, I thought, as I turned up, how can they afford to pay me 300 pounds when this broadcasts to eight people? Because it's digital radio, it's not broadcast. Yeah. And I began broadcasting, and about 10 minutes later, these emails began, began flooding in from Tokyo and Los Angeles, nice to hear your toe, great blood. And suddenly you realize that with this new world of digital radio, you're broadcasting to the entire world. Mm -hmm. And I think over the next five years, digital, digital, it changes everything for radio, in my opinion. There's no ratings as well, though. So it's hard to know if your show's going to do well because you're not rated by what people are listening on the internet. You know what I mean? That's true. That's true. How 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 do the do the advertisers judge it? God knows. Yes. Well, they're just judging by it. When did you be, when did you become a businessman, Jones? I'm not. I'm the worst, mate. Don't let me fool you. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> as, I'm as bad as you. <laughs> oh, well, you probably can't be, worse. You can't be as bad as me. But you, it, I mean, I'm just astonished that you're asking these questions about who cares whether people are, what, are listening or not. As long as you enjoy it. As long as I can keep going, I'm happy. And as long as people stop you in the street and say, "I love your show," which they do. Yeah. And as long as there's a chance of getting Cliff Richard in. Oh, just think about that. Please don't find me till after <laughs> I've had Cliff. <laughs> yes, that's, that's all I asked. Imagine, are they all alive? The Shadows. Um, well, at the British Music Hall of Fame, because we decided last year to copy the Americans. Sorry, we're in America. You Americans. Um, at the Hall of Fame, they gave the '50s Hall of Fame position to Cliff and the Shadows, but because um, Johnny Vegas was making the presentation and was utterly drunk. He's the British comedian who gets too drunk. And uh, he forgot to mention the shadows. So it looked like Cliff was getting the getting, oh, the, getting the prize. But in fact, it was the shadows. And certainly Bruce Walsh was there. And I actually shook Bruce Walsh's hand, the rhythm guitarist of the shadows, and didn't wash for two days. It was a great really? moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I think I'd wash after a cliff had been on it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you never know where You'd he's shower, been. wouldn't you? You don't know where he's You'd been, shower. do you? No, no, no. <laughs> um, are we visiting the Duke? And we'll be right back with Tony Wilson. Thanks for listening. You listen to Jones's Jukebox on Indy 1031 with my guest Tony Wilson from the 24 Hour Party People. Um, now you got a band, yeah? I got a band. I kind of the problem with the music industry is there's nothing like it. I mean, you know, radio is fun, TV is fun, movies are fun, but unfortunately, there is nothing like rock and roll. Even watching. A gentleman like you play the guitar was was thrilling there. And about two years ago, I came across this remarkable bunch of young black MCs, and I hate British hip-hop because it sounds American, and they didn't sound American, and they sounded real, and they had that look in their eyes, the kind of thing I saw in your eyes in 1976. And um, there's his mobile again. And Uh I decided to... uh, Okay. Yes. Um, I'm doing my radio show right now. <laughs> yes, that'll be fabulous. Thank you. Bye bye. Is that the wife? No, some oh. bird. I don't know. Okay. Proceed. Sorry. So anyway, um, let not get in the way of me selling my band, which I'm here to do slightly. So I just fell in love with them, and because all Manchester black groups <laughs> get it, get get your phone, answer your phones. Go <laughs> oh, on, I'll turn it off. <laughs> because all most Manchester black groups screw up, they fall out with each other, they argue, uh, they just things don't go right, which is why there has not been much success out of what is the most the most vibrant Afro Caribbean community in Britain. Moss Side Manchester is famous uh, for many things, including violence and stuff. But um, it's produced very little, and I thought I would help these boys. I ended up signing them, and there's an album came out about a month ago, and strangely. The funding is not from any multinational record company. It's a little indie called F4, which is me. But the funding comes from my agent, which is the Richard Stone Partnership in London. And Richard Stone, the company's founder, was Benny Benny Hill's manager. So in some bizarre way, Benny Hills is funding my group, Raw Tea. And they call Raw Tea. It stands for Realize and Witness Talent. How old are these kids? Uh, 17. And there's four boys. And they're all, they do this thing called spitting. Uh, yeah, I remember that. No, 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 that, that was gobbing. And that was, that was when, in fact, I remember I used to have to issue my film crews when we, 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 we actually never filmed you live. We had you in studio. But when we went out to do The Clash and stuff like that, I had to issue my film crew with anoraks because of the amount of gobbing yes. and, and spitting going on. Now, spitting is the new, is the phrase used in England for writing poetry, for young black boys writing right. this, kind of, these, this kind of rhyming yeah. stuff, spitting. And it's called grime or rhythm and grime. And now what they do is called crossbreed, which is where grime has become more musical, using musical samples rather than noise samples. And I've been told to say this by my boys because they keep teaching me these things. So let's play it. What track is this called? This is called Money Makes the World Go Round. Is, this, ho- is, this, gonna, is this a single? No, it's not. It's just an album track. Um, you, uh, I'll leave the album for you for later for the singles. Now, there's no profanity, is there, Tony? There, there is no swearing on this at all, Mr. Jones, even though they, they don't use the word rotters at all. I know what these spitting guys are like. Take it away, Mr. Shovel. He fucking knew that. Is there any more? You better be on standby, Shovel. Can't trust him. He's thinking, isn't he? What did he say? What did he say? He said fuck? Excellent. We're up. 
You listen to Jonesy's jukebox. I'm really sorry about that. I did, I, oh, dear me. <laughs> I'm sorry. I really am terribly sorry. Um, you just shot yourself in the I foot. I didn't do that. I, I forgot that there was an F on that one at, at all. I'm really sorry. Right, just oh. for that. I'm, I'm going to play Tommy Bruce and the Bruisers for you. This is your punishment. <laughs> this is your punishment, mate. Um, well, let me see here. What we got here? Track 14. Just to show you. This is what a real spitter's like, mate. Well, okay, good, this is good, what a real good, spitter's good, like. Good, Take good. it away, darling. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Well, no, I understand, I was, I was running through, I couldn't imagine. I only have the ability to do two beats. And then come right out of my buffer. Cool. 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 He's alright, we are the London boys. Have they all got smell? Come on, put this is a great moment. Yeah, it's yeah. censored yeah. by Steve yeah. Jones. He's just, yeah. I can go back on the topic. Yeah. 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 You're listening to Jonesy's Jukebox on Indie 1031 with my guest, Tony Wilson. That was your favourite band, Freddie and the Dreamers. Manchester's finest, Freddie and the Dreamers. A postmodern joke, if ever there was one, but good pop songs. I'm telling you now. Yes. I'm and telling you right away. My favourite one was, um, If you got to Make a Fool of Somebody. That's actually the first one. That's a lovely How's song. How's that go? If you got, I don't ask me to sing for. Come on, haven't come on. If you gotta make a fool of somebody, dear, you really can't hurt me. I'm the one that worries. I don't. I'll have to play that one. Why, well, certainly not, not, better, me. not, not <laughs> now, not now, but later. All right. And before that was Airspray uh, soundtrack, and that was Madison Time by the Ray Bryant combo, and then we had Mike San doing uh, Come Outside. Love that song. Warm and, warm and fuzzy. And then we started that with Tommy Bruce and the Bruisers doing We Are the London Boys. And before that, we had to take your song off the air because they were swearing profanity, as I told you. I'm sorry about my boys. That was, uh, they were, someone asked who they were. They're called, Real, they're called Raw T, which stands for Realise and Witness Talent. And they are the most exciting things in my life, which... Um, I think you knew they swore on that. I didn't know, honestly. I was trying to, I couldn't imagine how they would have sworn on that. But I think fact, you were fact, trying to live r Bill Grundy. Uh, no, I wasn't. Do you ever get annoyed? This brings us back to my final bit of my interview of you, yes. Steve. Do you ever get annoyed that John is perceived as the anarchist rebel? And that day on the British live television show, John swore a minor swear word, but it was actually you that did the two F words and yes. caused the real trouble. Mm -hmm. You don't mind that, you, that, that people think it was John who was the real rebel? Well, no, because it's on film. The, the reality of it. And also, is it true what Malcolm told me, your manager, that when he got to the... It was us. I look at it as it was us, the Sex Pistols. It was a, but you know was I mean? it... What, I think it wasn't you. I think it was a TV presenter. Because Malcolm says that when they got to the green room of that TV show, quarter to six, yeah. he suddenly realised that his group, you, were out of it. But the presenter, Bill Grundy, this 60-year-old man, was even more, more drunk than more, you were. That's true. That is absolutely true. And Malcolm, actually, although it all looks as if it was planned because it created such an amazing furore in Britain, yeah. that Malcolm was terrified because the presenter was drunker than you. Yeah. No, he had no clue, Malcolm. <laughs> he takes credit for it. Of course he does. He's a you know, he takes credit for anything that works, you know. <laughs> and he's, he, he, you don't see him when it backfires, but no, I it's mean, classic, you know. It's good stuff. The I, idea, I, like I, I always think that Malcolm actually failed completely because Malcolm... I thought Malcolm's dream as an anarchist situationist was to create a group that was number one in Britain just because they were disgusting. And that's what he wanted, to make a joke on the industry. Yeah. But in fact, for some bizarre set of reasons, you were artistically, culturally and sociologically fantastically important. Mm. So he actually, he, he didn't get what he wanted, did he? No. No, I don't think everyone... I don't think everyone takes him seriously. I don't think people believe that he, we were puppets. And he was pulling the strings. I don't. I don't think people believe that. No, and they might have for ten minutes, but as you heard, my fine axe playing. Yes, you, you know. Well, that's another another debate that goes on. Sometimes I've heard John and you say this, and actually, you were a hell of a group. Yeah, we're a great rock and roll band. And that's were. what. And basically, at the end of the day, if you don't have that substance, you n you'll never last. You can only bluff it for so long. You got to be. You got to have some underneath girth. To be to keep it going, you know, you can only pull the wall over people's eyes for so long. I mean, you go, you've seen bands who are horrendous, 
Would you go and see him again? No. 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 And and also, you know, your chord changes. Although uh, my colleague, my guitarist, Vinnie Riley, always says that the reason why punk changed music, and we're going to get very technical here, and you have to, you have to follow me here, was that when you learnt the guitar before punk came along, you learnt C... F, G, 7, E, A, B, 7, which is the 1, 4, 5 tonal system. And suddenly punk came along, and ideally you couldn't play guitar, so all you could do was the F, F, F chord shape. And if you look at any of them, including you, you were just going up and down that fretboard with the F shape, weren't you? At first, yeah. At yeah, first. And, that, and what that did was free music. It freed melodic imagination. Yeah. I'm not being technical here. The other bit I want to ask you about is... you seem we, very like, we like the F word and we like the F chord. <laughs> <laughs> if only my little boys hadn't said it. And, only if you, if I, and thank God you said it on Grundy, because the next week I was going to film a documentary with you. It was the Anarchy Tour, and we had yeah. a, I was, had a day with my film crew. But you caused such a fuss that there was a leader in the Times, the great newspaper of Britain, saying that these people are disgraceful, they're undermining society. Mm -hmm. And my, my, the boss of my TV company read it on a railway station at 8 in the morning and cancelled my film crew. Mm. And I can remember that terrible day. You were in Manchester. You were thrown from hotel to hotel. Yeah. And I finally went out to try and find you at the Arosa Hotel in Didsbury at midnight. And when I got to within a mile from this hotel in a suburb, it was surrounded by fire engines and police cars. It was cordoned off. Yeah. You were like the Ebola virus, weren't you? It's great, though, wasn't it? it? Well, did you think it was great at the time? Because you looked a bit bedraggled to me and a bit, a bit scared, weren't you? Well, it, it was. we didn't know what was going on. It was exciting but we didn't know what was going on. You know what I mean? But You can heroicise it looking back, but... Look, look coming from a little tow rag from Shepherd's Bush, that was amazing. To be the centre of British culture. You know what I mean? So, whatever. One album. One album, One Tony. album. Well, at that point, it was, it was two singles swapped from company to company. And yeah. The album was, was so much later. It was, it was the live performances, wasn't it? I don't know. That's what got us all going and got us nuts. You seem easy going, and my last, my last little question here is, every time John and Malcolm are interviewed, there is real, real angst there, isn't there, between yeah. the two of them? Yeah. Are, are you just easy going about, about those two? I've just learned to accept people for what they are. I don't have resentments. I love John. I like Malcolm. You know, if I saw Malcolm now, I'd be talking to him. You know, what's the point? I don't want to die of cancer. You know what I mean? I think that's wise. And can I ask then, as a, as a last favour, my last track had to be taken off. Yes. But I have another track I'd like to play, which oh is no. actually by Malcolm. Oh, okay. No, it's by Malcolm. This is... Is that, is that position? Don't possible? make me censor you again, you know, Tony. I'm, no, I just, no it's, it's a big moment in my life. To be actually censored by Steve Jones has got to go down in history. <laughs> something, something phenomenal. <laughs> but um, our mutual friend Malcolm, and he is lovely. I mean, the point about Malcolm and John... They're both incredibly funny, and they should just get on with it, Yeah, they? yeah. But they're, they're, they're like two peas in the pod, so they just butt heads all the time, you know. So we got to go to the Duke, we'll be back, and we'll play that song. Okay, cool. And thanks for listening. That's the truth, though. That's how I feel. You know what I mean? About them guys. I'm too old to be carrying... Them resentments and bullshit around. You gotta let go of shit.